of constitutional, uh, uh, the doctrine of proportionality from a constitutional angle. And then that will determine whether that remedy for conservatory orders is effective or not. Now, uh, the first petitioner was impeached. <coughs> the first petitioner was impeached on five major grounds. That is important for you to determine the <coughs> effectiveness of the remedy and the prima facie case threshold. He was impeached on uh, gross violation of the constitution. On that link, there were three grounds which were confirmed on gross violation of the constitution. Secondly, the first petitioner was impeached on the ground that there are serious reasons to believe he's committed crimes under national law. In this case, crimes under the National Cohesion and Integration Act. And that the last ground, he was impeached on gross misconduct. Now, in applying the in applying the, in, in, in determining the effectiveness of this remedy, the petitioners are arguing that you, you issue conservatory orders that reinstate this person to office. And we are, our position is that you cannot issue conservatory orders that reinstate this back, person back to office because of the reasons why he was impeached. So you have to examine the grounds for impeachment. Secondly, what is the decision that is before court? What is the decision that is before court? Have the petitioners amended their notice of motion app, app, uh, application to reflect the grounds which they are not happy about? Because not, we presume, my lady, that they are, of course, not complaining that the Senate dismissed some of the grounds. We presume that they are complaining about the decision of the Senate, which is agreed to. So you, with their agreement. So, so, so um, if you look at the, at, 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 at the motion, you will find particulars, particulars of matters which uh, relate to allegations which the Senate dismissed. And they are laying that as a basis for the grand of conservatory orders. You will find dominantly material with respect to ground number seven, which the Senate dismissed. Then they are saying that is a basis for the grant of conservatory orders. And they are saying, but to that extent, they have not completed the test in terms of uh, putting an arguable case in the court. They ought to have amended their pleadings to reflect the correct, the correct complaint which they have before court, and which they ought to lay before court. Secondly, uh, thirdly, in determining the threshold, in determining the ability threshold, I just need to mention two decisions from the Supreme Court that you will have to consider. In determining whether they have a prima facie case, you will, of necessity, look at the decision of the Sonko, the, 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 the Sonko judgment that has been famously uh, described as the Sonko judgment. Now, this Sonko judgment contains principles when it comes to the threshold for all these three grounds that the Senate found to have been confirmed. So for purpose of determining for purpose of determining an arguable case, the petitioners have not been granular. They have not complained for purpose of laying a basis with respect to these grounds on why, for example, when it comes to the question of threshold, are they complaining that these grounds don't meet the constitutional threshold? So I invite you to look at the case of Munya uh, as well. And lastly, on the question of the ground of conservatory orders, the Kariuki matter decision. There is a reason why the, the Supreme Court, <coughs> the 
and the Justice Kanyuki Mati case has the as 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 called the, the, the high court for applying the doctrine of judicial respect in granting expert orders. And we are arguing that if you look at that decision again, the same reasons why the, 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 the Supreme Court uh, informed the court not to grant uh, conservatory orders with respect to active parliamentary proceedings, those same same reasons are available when you are determining the effectiveness of the remedy of conservatory orders. And it's our firm submission here that uh, conservatory orders, if you look at the, 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 the four corners of the Constitution, the provisions of Article uh, 23, should not be granted in a manner that reinstates the impeach Deputy President back to office. Because then what will be the purposes of, of, of granting that conservatory orders? He goes back to office, he's been impeached uh, for violating national values and principles of governance. So where does the where does the test uh, 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 lead to? We submit that the remedy for the grant of conservatory orders that they instead is not available to them. Uh, the reason is that conservatory orders is a highly and ineffective remedy. Conservatory orders will mean then that this court intervenes on matters which are dominantly political. And uh, in the Munya decision, in the Munya decision, uh, there is a finding that you cannot intervene on matters which the Supreme Court has stated are properly supposed to be properly before the other arms of Parliament. It is only the the, 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 the Senate and the, the National Assembly, as it were, in the first instance, that can determine the question of impeachment. Impeachment is about policy, political accountability, and governance responsibility. So to that extent, I, uh, I wish to submit that uh, the petitioners have not uh, uh, in terms of the effect it will be of this remedy laid before court enough material. And uh, I wish to uh, stop there and ask uh, my colleague Michelle to complete our other part of the submission. Thank you. Um, my lords and my lady, my name is Michael Mushemi. I'm appearing for the ninth respondent. On our part, we rely on two affidavits, one sworn on the 22nd of October, and a supplementary affidavit sworn on the 27th of October, and submissions and list of authorities dated 27th of October. My lords and my lady, permit me to address you on two critical issues. One is the issue of public interest, and the second is the legal theory of realism as to why conservatory orders cannot issue, especially as to sustain the first petitioner in office as deputy president. On the first issue of public interest, my lords and my lady, you have been told this morning by the petitioners that the office of the deputy president can remain vacant for a period of even up to 60 days because there is no function that would not uh, take place in government. It is our submission first, uh, my lords and my lady, that the deputy president is mandated to chair the Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council, which is created by Article 6, <coughs> subsection 2 of the Constitution and Section 187 of the Public Finance Management Act. And the Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council coordinates government policies, legislation, and functions as between the national and county government. My lords and my lady, the law prescribes that the chair and convener of this council can only be the deputy president. There is no other person in law that can convene the Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council. Secondly, my lords and my lady, under Article 240 of the Constitution, there is established the National Security Council. And one of the members of the National Security Council is the Deputy President, and it is our submission, it is our submission that pursuant to Article 240 of the Constitution, there is no other person 
or hold out any other office, who can substitute the Deputy President as a member of the National Security Council? This is important, uh, my lords and my ladies, <coughs> because the National Security Council exercises supervisory control of a National Security Act organ. This is a critical function of the state. In the absence of the Deputy <coughs> President, there is legitimate reason to believe that the National Security Council is not properly constituted. And again, this is important, my lords and my lady, because if you look at Article 240, subsection 8, the Council may, with the approval of Parliament, deploy national forces outside Kenya for either regional or international peace support operations or other support operations. So that the situation subsisting as of today, my lords and my lady, is that the National Security Council cannot deploy any national forces either for support or operations within the country or international peace support operations. And I urge and respectfully submit to this court to take judicial notice that officers from the National Police Service are currently deployed in Haiti to support with peace operations. <coughs> so that the argument by the petitioners that the office of the Deputy President can continue to remain vacant is not available because these two critical functions provided by the Constitution and law would not effectively be carried out. On the second issue, my lords and my lady, I invite you to look at Article 3 and Article 4 of the Constitution, and particularly Article 4, subsection 2, which states that the Republic of Kenya shall be a multi-party democratic state founded on the national values and principles of governance referred to in Article 10. The words used in this section are shall, which is mandatory. And the first petitioner avers in his supplementary affidavit, and I wish to draw your attention to his supplementary affidavit in paragraph 17, that is a supplementary affidavit dated the 27th of October 2024. And on oath, he avers on paragraph 17 that I observe that in other open and democratic societies, and he goes on to say, unlike Kenya. So the first petitioner is averring on oath that Kenya is neither an open nor a democratic society. That is his own affidavit. It is our submission that conservatory orders would militate against legal realism to reinstate a person who cannot safeguard the oath he took as deputy president, safeguard the constitution, and who avers in open public that this country is not a democratic society. My lords and my lady, I also invite you to look at Article 130 and Article 131 of the Constitution, which provides that the head of state, the president is the head of state, and the deputy president deputizes him. And um, in the authority of the president as provided in Article 131, particularly subsection 2, C, and D, is to promote and enhance the unity of the nation and to promote respect for the diversity of the people and communities of Kenya. It is our humble submission that any grant of conservatory orders that would sustain the first petitioner in the office of deputy president would be a violation of this article. 
it would also be a violation of Article 147, which provides that the Deputy President is the principal assistant to the President and shall deputize the President in execution of his functions. And why this is important is because in the supplementary affidavit dated the 27th of October, we have deponed, or the ninth respondent has deponed, and particularly in paragraph 16, several averments by the first petitioner in which he infers that the president is responsible and must be held to account if anything happens to him, and I will not uh, indicate the rest, uh, you will find them in the, uh, uh, the supplementary affidavit. So that my lords and my lady, pursuant to Article 147, it is now no longer tenable that the first petitioner, either at the interlocutory stage or on the final orders of the petitioner, can continue to be the principal assistant to the president. My lords and my lady, I also draw your attention to executive order number one of 2023, which stipulates that the deputy president shall chair cabinet committees and shall coordinate issues of budget and policy making of constitutional commissions and other independent offices. Our first submission is that as we speak, there is no person who can execute the function of chairing subcommittees, chairing cabinet committees. <coughs> On the issue of constitutional commissions and independent offices, it is our humble submission that the Senate, having found the first petitioner guilty of violation of Article 160, then he cannot coordinate any functions with the judiciary effectively. The final thing, uh, my lords and my lady, I would wish you to look at is the issue of political parties particularly the role they have in policy formulation, political mobilization, and political democratization <coughs> under Article 4 of our Constitution. <coughs> the first petitioner was impeached by the Senate by a supermajority, which included members of his own political party and coalition. And I would want to draw you to a comparative analysis. When you retire, you will look at impeachment processes which we have defined to in the USA, in South Africa, and Brazil. But I would be instructive to note that closer home in South Africa, when Tabo Mbeki lost confidence of his own party, he resigned in 2008. And when Jacob Zuma lost the confidence of his own party, he resigned in 2018. <coughs> So we respectfully submit on behalf of the ninth respondent that because of those two issues, conservatory orders cannot issue in this matter. Thank you, my Lord and my lady. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, my lords and my lady. I'll only take two three minutes to Delve into the reasons why we support the applications to set aside the conservatory orders and pray that the applications for those conservatory orders be dismissed. My name is George Murugara, appearing with the team for the National Assembly of Kenya. <coughs> I begin by drawing your attention to the provisions of Article 118 <coughs> of the Constitution which actually deals with the public participation, which has been debated on and argued on in the House, 
And what I used to draw the attention of the court to is <coughs> Article 1, Paragraph B, where Parliament is mandated to facilitate public participation and involvement in the legislative and other business of Parliament and its committees. What I wish to point out here is that not all business of the National Assembly or of Parliament <coughs> has to undergo a public participation because not all legislative uh, duties nor other business actually does go through public participation. There are legislative processes in this country which need not be subjected to public participation and also other business of the House which need not be subjected to public participation. What is important is the wording of that clause. The word all is not used because if that was the intention that everything that Parliament does has to undergo public participation, it would have been that in all legislative and in all other business of Parliament and its committees. However, I take you to Article 145, where there was public participation in spite of the fact that there is no provision that there ought to have been public participation when the motion was actually made. The correct position is that any member of the National Assembly on attaining the threshold can actually move a motion uh, that the president or the deputy president be impeached. Once that motion is moved, then it goes to chamber, it is debated, and it is voted on. So it is actually for parliament to determine when to take such a motion for public participation. And I confirm that here, out of abundant caution, parliament did take this motion to public participation on two days, as was even ordered by the court. <coughs> and after the public participation, there was debate on it in parliament. It is this debate that takes into account the public participation, the views that were collected from the public out there. Then after that, a vote was taken, and therefore that process cannot be faulted. It cannot be said to have been flawed in any, in any way, because in spite of the fact that there was no requirement for public participation, it was done out of public motion. Finally, there has been an argument that under Article 149, there ought to have been public participation regarding the nominee who was taken uh, to the House for a voting. And here we must draw the distinction drawn that this is not an approval. Approval on appointments comes under different articles of the Constitution. It's clearly provided that the appointment would be with approval of Parliament or approval of the National Assembly. Here, what took place was just a vote. There was no motion because there was no requirement for a motion. There was no debate because there was no requirement for a debate. Because what the law provides is the president nominates and the house votes. So the house sits, it's called to vote on the nominee on the basis that possibly the nominee is known to the entire country. And this is the reason why there is no public participation. If parliament votes against that candidate, then the president would have to nominate another candidate and continue doing so within a span of 60 days and until he gets a vote that is positive in his favor, not an approval. And we've said that approvals usually come under the um, public appointments, parliamentary approval act. This is the one that governs approval. This is the one which provides that there must be public participation in all public appointments when actually parliament has to offer an approval. So finally, public participation here goes to article number one, where parliament is exercising delegated powers of the sovereignty of the people of Kenya. It is presumed that when the parliament votes, the candidate is known to the people of Kenya and through their elected representatives, they have actually to cast votes which are in tandem with how their constituencies would have voted. So with these uh, <laughs> remarks, it is my submission that the nomination and the subs subsequent vote in his favor 
of Professor Kibore Kedeke was ordered, it was actually appropriate and it cannot be voted in any way, and therefore those conservatory orders should be removed. Thank you very much. On preliminary issue, to the, it's good I came last because I, it was a learning experience for me, but also for, for, for preliminary issues. To the extent that a lot of the petitioners and even some aspect of the respondent dwelt on merit review of the petition, when this is an application for conservatory orders, those submissions should be disregarded by the court. That's the first one. The second aspect, even though the decision for the petitioners is an application for their rights in persona, the fact that the IEDC is here and this is a public interest matter, your decision will be a decision in red. So the IEDC will be asking that you clarify for it the applicable principle and guide it on first principles. The third one, and which is very important, it seems that there's a general agreement that the law that will apply, and this is the only thing that all the lawyers agreed on, is Munya. Ita Gatirao Munya is the standard for conservative orders. We believe the court should adopt that standard. I will not dwell much on the Prima Fasi case. <coughs> But I will dwell a little bit on the negatory aspect as it relates to my client. <coughs> my client has been bundled up into these proceedings to establish the application for conservatory orders on two grounds. And this is important for the court to note this, on two grounds. The first one, the petitioner said that the IEBC has a constitutional role in filling a vacancy in the office of deputy president under Article 149 of the Constitution. And this is important. The second aspect they say that even though they have a role, they cannot discharge that role because they do not have the constitutional and legal capacity to function, as they don't have commissioners. This is very interesting. Oh, this is what my professor at Harvard Law will call, my professor will call, constitutional chaos. So they tell you there is a role to be played by the constitutional board. And then they say, having, once you establish there is a role to be played by the IEBC, 
IEBC cannot play that role. The worship. The in Peter Dakirao Munya, and this is a point that has not been made by most of the council, the issue of conservatory orders is not for the benefit of the private or the public party. Conservatory orders is for the benefit of the court. Because they are supposed to preserve a judicatory capacity of the court. Just that. If a party benefits because of that, that is collateral. And that is really important for this court. Because once you establish it for your adjudicatory capacity, two things fall away. The first thing that would fall away, if you find that there is a remedy, there is an alternative remedy in merit review when the petition is heard, there are remedies that subsist when the petition is heard, then that aspect falls away. The second aspect that will fall away if you make a finding that there's a constitutional mandamus, and I will refer to you to Article 1257 of the Constitution. If you make a finding that there's a constitutional mandamus, injunction, edict, direction to the court, then you have to stop there. And Article 1457 is in such mandatory terms that there is no other way that this court can interpret. X, the president shall cease to hold office. Constitutional injunction, mandamus. So once you, if those two findings are made, then there is no way the petitioners can establish the negatory aspect. As related to the two issues, the government of this view, the position of the IEBC is that the IEBC does not play any role. As it relates to vacancy through impeachment, under Articles 99 and 137 of the Constitution, there is no constitutional role for the IEBC. There is no statutory role for the IEBC, and I'll come to that, because we spend quite a bit of time, just like the predicament the court is in, whether it should intervene under 165, we also have that predicament. Is there a role for the IEBC? That is the question the CEO of the IEBC asked. And we came to the very considered conclusion, there is no role for us because of constitutional design, and I'll come to that constitutional design. Unlike the court, the IEBC has been involved in a lot of litigation against itself. And there is directions from the Supreme Court of the Republic on what IEBC can do and what IEBC cannot do. I want to refer the court to paragraph 13 of our submissions, the DBI case, the Supreme Court one. And IEBC here can be substituted also for this court, because this court is a creature of chapter 10, of the Constitution, the IEBC is a creature of chapter 15 of the Constitution. And this is what the Supreme Court says. At paragraph 13 of our, we quoted it verbatim. Number one, the Supreme Court says, the IEBC being a creature of Constitution and statute, could only discharge mandate vested in it explicitly by law. This court, being a creature of the Constitution and statute, can only discharge mandate vested in it explicitly by the law and the constitution. The second one, which is very important for, the, for, for this court, is the court saying that this was direction given under Article 10.2 of the constitution and the aspects of rule of law under Article 10.2. The third point that the court made, the IEBC, like other public bodies, could not by craft of innovation, and this is really important, Supreme Court. The IEBC, like other public bodies, could not by craft of innovation or interpretation extend its powers. So it is sufficient for the IEBC or even for this court to look at the constitution, look at the constitution and the statutory law and not get and 
exercise what is within the inner boundaries of life. And D, which is to this court, courts should not encourage extension of powers by constitutional or statutory bodies. And this is really important, paragraph 13 of our submissions. So the, the, the constitution of my client, IABC, is under Article 88.1, 253, and 259. <coughs> The position of the IEBC relating to this matter is that Article 149, 145, 150 establish a complete self-contained code. It is a constitutional codified mechanism. It's not a statutory mechanism for governors or members of, of National Assembly. It is a constitutional codified mechanism. So what this court is interpreting IEBC is a creator of the Constitution. This process is a creator of the Constitution. <clears throat> you cannot get out of the Constitution for this process. This court is a creator of the Constitution. So as it relates to the nomination by the President, as it relates to the parliamentary vote, it is not envisaged there is an involvement of the IEBC. This is a constitutional Mandamus. As against the IEBC, and I will say as against even this court, we also rely on the case of Engineer Geoffrey Sangwa, and the DPP, and 20 others, your brother Justice Odunga, paragraph 18 of our submissions. And he says that the law is very clear that powers must be expressly conferred, they cannot be a matter of implication. You cannot imply power. And this is the absurdity. If this court was to make a finding, for example, that this that IEBC has a role, the way IEBC conducts elections is known, or by elections. So the second order question we'll be asking the court is do we declare by election? Election by its nature is a contest. How will that contest of filling that office be had? Do we print ballot papers? Those are the secondary order questions that the absurdity of the finding of the court that the IEBC has a would entail. The second thing, our position, is that this constitution is very detailed. It is very interesting. This constitution tells you how it should be interpreted and in Article 10. It tells you in Article 201 how the principles of taxation that will apply. It has what we call constitutional carve-outs, the powers given to various entities. It will be high presupposition to assume that this constitution under 149 will have said that this process, it says, it says for even members of National Assembly, it says for members of National Assembly, and even in the elections that we have that, for an office that is that high, there is to say that the Constitution could not have said that IBC has a role or this court has a role would be a very grand supposition. The Lordship, we look at, so we ask the question, what the court should ask? If someone said IBC has a role, we look at the things that we look at. So we we'll say, what, 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 frame, what did the framers think? Can we look at constitutional history to say if there was a role for the IBC? The IBC looked at the Bomber's draft, Article 168. It looked at the WACO draft, Article 159.1, and we looked at the Harmonious draft. And in all of them, there is no role for the IEBC. So even by constitutional history and constitutional design, there was no role for the IEBC. In fact, there was a role in the WACO draft for the Supreme Court, and those submissions were, have been made by uh, Mr. Mugomi Piantoni. Thank you. Your Lordship, just one minute, I'm almost winding up. Your Lordship, for you to, and then there's a, there's a second issue, and then the, the reason why the court should not interfere <coughs> in this process, especially our find there's a role for IEBC. For you to make a role, for you to make a finding for you, that the first finding that you have to make, you have to make this first, the people who, we, who hold public office, they hold what we call rectal relationships. These are a relationship of trust and confidence within our constitutional architecture. 
relationship of trust and confidence within our constitutional architecture. So you have to make a finding first. There is a property in public office, okay, number one. And that confidence is to the constitution, number one. You have to make a finding. There is a property to hold in public office, okay? Even when there is a breach of that trust, and a finding has been made by other organs of the constitution. <coughs> And the court, the test has always been, the test has always been three, threefold. Number one, total interference, judicial fear. And we don't do that, our courts don't do that. We don't substitute, courts don't substitute their preferences to what other organs, are, other organs do. The second aspect has been total deference. Not what other organs do, but total deference to the constitution. And this is very funny, uh, Professor Gidu Mugai is here. I used to teach uh, first, uh, first year contract, and the case of Felthaus versus Billy came to mind, that the constitution is silent, so that means that we can read into things, or we can tell the court to intervene. The constitution is silent on the court intervention under 149, so we need to read into it. So that's the second aspect. Total difference, if, the, if there is a constitutional injunction, constitutional mandamus, against a public body or against this court, then the court should be able to, to deal with that. The third one is the intermediate test. And this is what the court has applied a lot here. The intermediate test is you do procedural constitutional compliance. This is our, our authorities in E181, Justice Majanja's judgment in the Finance Bill Act. In fact, uh, the decision of the Finance Bill Act Supreme Court came down a few a few hours ago, I think we we'll provide to the court. The court should look at it. The threshold for public participation is not BAT, <coughs> by the way. The threshold for public participation is even lower because of that decision. And when you look at that decision, which we provided to the court, the court does what we call procedural constitutional compliance. And what is that? You look at whether what happened and the threshold within the constitution have been made. No more than that. And. And that is supported even by the decision of the Supreme Court, which came down just a few minutes ago. And I want to read a small excerpt your worship on that decision, which we have provided to the court. Which one are you talking about? I'm talking of the, uh, it is the, your worship, just the citation is E031 of 2024, consolidated with E032, E033 of 2024. Came down just a few hours ago. And I will just refer the How court. is it reported? It is reported as E031. Let me just. It's not as important, but it is, a, it is a petition number E031 of 2024, Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury versus Okia Omtata. Petition number? E031 of 2024, as consolidated with petition number E032, E033 of 2024, Okia Umtata, uh, uh, the cabinet secretary for national treasury by Okia Umtata. I argued that but uh, I was led by uh, Mr. Gil Mugai, Mr. Ochiel, that is there, he can rebut, uh, but he was part of those proceedings. So the, the threshold is even lower for public participation, number one, that is something that the court has to look at. But importantly, what did the court say about interference at paragraph 208, and I will end here, the Lord Chief. Paragraph 208, the court, the Supreme Court of the Republic, <coughs> it quoted, it quoted the case of International Trade Administration Commission was in, uh, in South Africa. This is what it said, I'll just read a small excerpt. Where the constitution or valid legislation has entrusted specific powers and functions to a particular branch of government, courts may not usurp that power or function by making a decision of their preference. I think that is good. Right? It is a direction. And if you look at, at if you look at that case. If you look at Peter Munya, if you look at the negatory aspect, and if you look at the fact that there is 
at what the submissions of Marjan will say, Marjan and our, and our submissions, you will find there is an express constitutional injunction against interference, not only for this court, even against IEBC. Because if you told me this is an election you are able to clear, then I'll tell you how am I supposed to conduct this nomination process. And what are the constitutional orders flowing from that? The Lordship, our submissions are sufficient. I am being uh, told to step down, but I but thank you so much. Who has told you? I was I was being told by Professor <laughs> Gideon. Yeah, my, <laughs> my professor is telling me, <laughs> but if I can. Yes, yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but professor, but our submissions are those ones they are on record. Uh, and and even if there is a role to be played by IEBC, our position is those are administrative roles, which we will still play. But and that is provided for under section eleven of the IEBC Act, section thirteen one of the IEBC Act. The role that we have to do under 137 is, is, is to check the voters register and we check voters register for even people who uh, for Kenyans every other day, it's a public document. There's no role for the IEBC to play, and if the court was supposed to play, there was a role for us, then we say those are administrative role, but the court should not find a role for us. Just apply authority, you have quoted of E031 to E033 or 2074. It, it is hot off the press, I will submit it just now. Submit uh, to our sisters. I will, I will, Your Lordship. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this. My Lord, and I want to apologize if I appear to take the issue of discretion from you. <laughs> it was intended to keep my promise to you that we would be clear. We now get to know that every every side has a prefect. This <laughs> side, the prefect is Professor Gibbs. <laughs> my Lord. Uh, I just want to also add my voice uh, to the submissions that have been made by the respondents. And it should go on record that my name is Shaka from the Solicitor General uh, for the Attorney General, Reverend Professor Chief Mungai, and uh, Charles Mutila, and the, the rest of the, the team. <laughs> yes, my Lord. Uh, to say one or two things so that uh, we wrap up submissions from our end. My Lord, uh, it is not in contestation that under Article 145.7 of the Constitution, a final decision of impeachment was made. It is not in doubt, and that has not been controverted by either side. What we have. That is what we are challenged. A final order, at least, my Lord, was made. Secondly, my Lord, it is also not in contestation that a vacancy has arisen or arose in the office of the deputy president. It's also about not in contestation or in doubt that uh, Article 149 of uh, the Constitution was enforced in terms of the President nominating Professor Akram Kitura Kiniki as a nominee to that position under that Parliament voted on the same. And I would agree with my learned colleague who has just left to the floor, Mahat, that the framers of this constitution never intended that the IEPC plays a role when it comes to the issue of impeachment. <coughs> And my Lord, if they so intended, nothing could have stopped them from expressly stating that position. 
And therefore, my Lord, I am submitting to the interim orders that were granted and are in place cannot cure that position. And therefore, my Lord, uh, relying on the various authorities that have been cited, and more particularly, my Lord, the Munya case, which is a classic case in terms of uh, what will be required in the grant of uh, conservatory orders. It is my humble submission, my Lord, that that has not been met. I would also submit, my Lord, that when you look at the greater public interest, my Lord want to assuade you with the very many other arguments that have been uh, given by my learned colleagues that you will find favor that the discharge, the vacating or the value the orders that have been placed will find greater good than holding uh, those uh, orders in place. And therefore, my Lord, to conclude, I would urge my lady and my lords to find that uh, we cannot continue holding the country at Lansom. We need to make a decision <coughs> that some of the roles and the responsibilities that are played by the deputy president, which are currently at a standstill, would it be extremely good and critical that the moment these orders are vacated, the rest of the processes should be allowed to, uh, to be completed. I therefore humbly submit that you discharge the orders that are in place and uh, allow uh, the entire process to be completed. I submit my law. Thank you. My daughter, I want to confirm on behalf of the respondents that we rest there, that with your kind indulgence, if there is to be a reply, I think again we need to remind ourselves that it ought to be on points of law. If the case is rehashed afresh, we would still be here tomorrow and it would contrary to procedure. My Lord, I also request a direction on whether Persons who are not parties to the application because they are only two applicants have a right of reply because my understanding is that the only person with the right of reply are the parties who file the application, not the, the entire court hearing on this side. Thank you. Thank you. Why are we being created? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we still have to be address the parties or we have that. Yes, now the, the, the right uh, uh, to rejoin them is only limited to the applicants and not any other person supporting the application. So it will go only to the applicants. And in this case, we have two, and we have. Uh, How much do you think? I am addressing the court, please. Reply to the court. You have given us 30 minutes. Do we know 15 of 20 minutes? No, my there is a lot that has been canvassed in fact. They have given us the impression that they will need less than an hour. We have obviously done four hours and something. Mm -hmm. We were the worst things that we want. Okay, let, let us, let us we, we can do within 30 let's, minutes. Let, let's, 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 or less, let's depending on how much is able to cover. Mm -hmm. The only issue, my lord, that is the mischief is that since this is a court of record, we do not want to be accused. There is anything that needed a response that was not responded to. Otherwise, I'm very tired. We don't want to be here forever. So we shall we just are here to do the business and we go.
Okay, this is the way forward. We will give the respondents the time. Thirty minutes each. Not the respondents, but the applicants. Thirty thirty. Let's go. My Lord, may I please the court? Yes, I'm on what issue? On the same issue. Because I've been standing and uh, you I need to cut your eye. Uh still on the issue of uh, the the right to reply. My lords, you might remember that I am, uh, out of all, I am one of the unrepresented petitioners in Petition 11. And uh, for the... My lord, you might remember that uh, for the last uh, two weeks when this matter has been uh, being handled, I have been insisting that we made an application for conservatory orders prior to even the applications we are discussing now, and it was in the best interest of all of us that when discussing the conservatory applications, we be treated as, uh, as respondents. My Lord, unfortunately, uh, when uh, the court gave directions, it consolidated all the petitions, but gave direct, did not give directions on how our applications would be heard. Now, Mr. Also, Mr. Also, Mr. Also, Mr. Bosso, just a minute. Uh, we will restrict ourselves to the applications at hand. So if uh, yours is not among the two applications, then you may have to address that later. And the rejoinder should be on points of law. The rejoinder should be on points of law. My Lord, my Lord I stand guided, but I still wish to point out that there are very specific issues that I raised that were not raised by the other applicants and which the other side has responded to and uh, would leave the issues and responded to all together. You can, you can pass that, that uh, those submissions to the uh, to their council for the other applicants. Lord, before our council proceeds, uh, I am Wangi Munga, council for the forty third petitioner, Mr. Morano Moke, and we also had uh, an application with uh, with the name uh, we have a right to rejoin that a brief rejoin and it was one of the applications that was passed so we also have a brief right to rejoin that. we'll only take five minutes my lord Murara appeared in person and argued his own case and I am his counsel. We are here together with him. Let's give directions and you will proceed with these directions, which my Lord has very much said to give. There must be order in every proceeding. Who is that? Is it Mr. Yes, proceed. My Lord, my name is Ochiel. And it's a great privilege and honor for me to appear before you and to make the deputy president join Ochiel that is me man. Well, allow me to begin with uh, where my very good friend Mr. Samani is talk. I think he intended to cite to you paragraphs 209 and 210 of the Supreme Court decision. He stopped at 208, I believe that was a mistake. Because if you look at paragraph 209, this is what the Supreme Court has said this afternoon, that the framers of the Constitution made it possible for litigants, like our client, the Deputy President, without exception, to appoint the courts for redress of fundamental rights and on issues concerning interpretation of the Constitution to determine whether any law or anything said to be done under the authority of the Constitution is constitutional. Paragraph 210, Supreme Court, this afternoon, the court says that this constitutional inquiry, the inquiry to involved in, extends, the court when conducting this inquiry should bear in mind the limited beliefs contemplated under Article 23. No, that's sufficient to clear any doubts about your jurisdiction and to clear any doubts about your power to give conservatory orders. If there are any doubts, the court should now feel comfortable. Now, 
During the break, I inquired for my learned friend, Mr. Ken Kohl, a very good friend of mine, and I asked him, Dr. Ken Kohl, who is the governor of Mayo County? He told me, Kawira Mangaza. Then I asked him, by what authority? Is he still submitting on points of law, my lord? It's true. He went there. By what authority? He told me, by a conservatory order. And so, my lord, this court can give conservatory orders against impeachment. The conservatory order we are speaking about, the one I was speaking to my colleague about, was given to this court, not so far ago, on the 21st of August, 2024, in petition P429 of 2024. Let me come to the other case, the Kissing Governance case. I know Justice Ogunda, you are familiar with that case, you're not asking that much because at some point you gave directions indicating that you would not interfere with the conservatory orders in place and that that matter would come before Justice O'Connor, which is the decision my learned friend, another good friend, Mr. Nyamodi, spent a lot of time on. Hello? That case is different from this one on the issue of delay. Under section 32, <coughs> of the County Government Act. A vacancy in the office of deputy governor must be filled in 14 days. What did Purity Mora Torera do? She filed her petition on 1st of April, 2024. The Senate impeached Dr. Robert Moya on 14th of March 2024. So she was coming to court outside the 14 days. Lord, in this case, we have 74 days under the Constitution, Article 149. Those 74 days have history in the constitutional text. My Lord, if you look at page 233 of the CKRC final report, you find Kenyans speaking about, my Lord, the need to allow the transitional processes to be disputed. Well, the Constitution gives a lot of 14-day timelines, but in this case, it gives 74 days. And we submit that the purpose of that is to allow agreed parties to come to, before the court may be held. And so, my Lord, on the issue of delay, which is a distinguishing fact, which is why the court did not give Kirea conservatory orders, but gave Mwangaza conservatory orders, is that the 14-day period had expired when the petitioner went to court. But allow me to concur fully with two things that my learned friends, Mr. Nyamodi, and my good friend, Mr. Somani, say that Conservatory orders are ready for the court because the court has a duty under Article 23 to fashion appropriate reliefs. Conservatory orders, as they said, help the court to preserve a matter. And the matter to be, to be preserved here is an impeachment of both of the National Assembly and the Senate and the subsequent nomination of Kithure Kindiki to the office of deputy governor. And again, unlike Mora, he's here to take off here. So the subject matter before the court is still live. And you can and the need to preserve it. But on the nature of conservatory orders, I agree fully with the submissions of the Attorney General. The case they cite, TSS spinning helps the petition more than it helps the respondent. Because in TSS spirit, the court says that conservatory orders act as tools for preservation of the subject matter hold the subject matter in situ. They maintain <coughs> the situation of the subject matter before the mischief crept in. The mischief crept in here when Wendy Mutuse filed his motion. So the conservatory order preserves that state of affairs. It takes us to the point before the mischief 
crack team. More mischief will creep in if, despite this litigation, it directly did its own into office. Among other cases we agree with, cited by the National Assembly is Italian Industries, helps the DP on the point that conservatory orders are tools for preservation of a particular state of affairs. A particular state of affairs which so far you preserved is that our client is the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. We ask you to sustain the conservatory orders. My Lord, the Assembly of Embu, argued by the Supreme Court, is distinguishable. In that case, the Attorney General told the Supreme Court that if a vacancy occurs mid-term in the office of Deputy Governor, then that vacancy would remain to the end of the term. The vacancy, paragraph 28, County Assembly of Embu, the Attorney General told the Supreme Court would remain to the end of the term, it would remain unfilled. That term, we had not yet amended Section 32, Capital B of the County Government's Act. It was amended in reaction to this Supreme Court case. And so the Supreme Court, to that suggestion by the Attorney General, says that no, 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 we cannot have an indefinite vacancy in such a vital office. That case is distinguishable. I reiterate that the timeline we have here is 74 days. We're yet to eat into a quarter of those days, my lord. And from the posture taken by this court, it's possible to hear this case and conclude it within those 74 days. My lord, this, this petition, within those 74 days. All the three chains of Kenyan court when required have risen to the occasion. BBI did not last the three, five years my friend Mr. Bianconi spoke about. It lasted a matter of months. And so it's possible for this court to hold things in place and to expedite the main petition. My Lord, unless that happens, my becoming friend, Professor Gideon Mijay, spoke about the dissipation of the subject matter. He said this has already dissipated. My friend, Professor Gianda said, likened it to a death which has already occurred, and so it, there's no coming back from it. The Senate in their submission suggests damages. The petition does not give you for damages. In short, my Lord, if at this stage, the respondents can tell you that the court cannot craft remedies. Dr. Kian Kolu bases his preliminary objection on that point. He says that you should not touch this dispute because you will not be, possible, not be able to craft any remedies after hearing the case. Well, if at this stage, before you hear the case on the merits, you can be told that what would happen when without conservative orders you hear the case and the petitioners succeed? Well, as I move to conclude, the Attorney General urges you to find on the basis of the vacancies in the IDC, that is public interest in allowing the process to conclude. My Lord, there is an authority, a court order by this court in proceedings to which the Attorney General was party. The Attorney General, in January of this year, 26th of January 2024, in the Panisa case, the Abdullahi versus the Attorney General, was directed to reconstitute the IBC. He has not done that. Today, the Attorney General stands before you and tells you that on, on account of his delict, on account of his and his client's contempt of court, you should exercise your equitable discretionary remedy of conservatory orders in his and his client's favor. Another party, cannot benefit from their own wrongdoing. That fact of vacancy in the IEBC against an order of this court should not be evaluated in favor of the Attorney General and to the disfavor of the petitioners. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hello. Are there any pending litigation on the IEBC? 
There are, yes or not, yeah. but this order has not been stayed, it has not been appealed. That's okay. Yes, my lord. Hello. There's a case that we did with uh, my good friend, Mr. Adrian Kamado. It's called Itubi versus Law Society of Kenya, where Justice Omudi gave directions and orders to maintain the status quo pending the determination of the matter in court. Itubi, through my good friend, Adrian Kamado Njenga, went to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal, my lord, affirming those orders, found that it was an act of mischief to ask the Court of Appeal to vacate conservatory orders meant to preserve the status quo pending the hearing of the matter in court. We submit that the application to vacate made before you is an act of mischief. There's another case, my lord, on this issue of vacating conservatory orders. This case was argued by my good friend, Mr. Yamodi, when he was still on the good side of things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Professor Gideon Jigai was also in it. Those days, Yamodi was a good guy. He had not joined the bad company of Mr. Gumbo, who's my friend. <laughs> now, this is what the Court of Appeal said. The Court of Appeal said that... Yamodi must be a bad guy if Gumbo is bad. The Court of Appeal said, hello. But when weighty challenges have been placed before you, before a court, and the court has issued conservatory orders, one requires a very strong case to lift those conservatory orders. My Lord, a very strong case has not been made before you to lift the conservatory orders. Instead, a very strong case has been made to sustain and to affirm and to reiterate the conservatory order. Well, I close with the issue of public interest. And again, thanks to the doctrine of presidents, you do not have to think too hard on this. In Attorney General versus Martini, shutting out 50 CISs whose appointment was questioned before the court, the Court of Appeal, my Lord, said that it would not be it would be no consolation to tell the Kenyan people that although service has been rendered, although unconstitutional service has been rendered, it's still service. The Court of Appeal said, my Lord, that service in violation of the Constitution is no service. And in a case that Professor Ojenda argued, there will no case. When I, mean, I, I didn't cite that. I am citing it. I am citing it in the reply. In response, when I thought on points of law, you refer to cases that have been cited by the other side. No. Can't pick up my case. I didn't have it. Well, if he didn't argue it, he should have argued it. This is a question. <laughs> 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 you are told about the public interest. The question of opinion of all. He cannot argue the whole case. Yeah, I think he cannot argue the whole case. Because otherwise, he would also have the right yes, to be found in there. And he would yeah. hear from much longer time. Back and forth. Yes, we know. If that will help, my lord, how we have, for example, presented to you the Supreme Court President. Because the, the purpose of the agenda as well, my lord, is to distinguish and to tell the court points which they were said are concealed. So when you say it, then we give him a right of and, and reply lord, on it, that issue. It's in our submissions. It is. Do you accept that we'll give him a right of reply on that issue? On oh, this case, yes, yes. my lord. Okay. Because it's in our submissions. Okay. Proceed. The whole case is in our submissions, my lord, and you can distinguish it very short too. And the court said, in short, that it is in the public interest to keep out a person if the validity of the appointment is questioned. He had granted his client to assume office despite uh, a court order to that appointment. As a lot, the office here is a high state office. If Kitore Kindiki assumes office, he will make directives, he will make policies, he will commit omissions. 
My Lord, this court is yet to design a mechanism for reversing the policies, the decisions, the directives that you would like. If at the end you find that the impeachment and the nomination of both are constitutional, the constitution would have been irreparably violated. And my Lord, I close on the point that this case is arguable. In fact, the courts had to stop Mr. Medimo many times and was lenient to many others of my colleagues who strayed into the merits of agenda being uh, at the forefront of that. The council argued, argued the merits on both sides of the IAP. And so, although that demonstrates that parties are fighting at the least, they are ready to argue the petition and will do so as an, at the highest opportunity. We request you, my Lord, to allow the request for conservative others to please preserve the dispute and let our parents, our father parents, for you be of some meaning under the Constitution. Thank you for the opportunity, my Lord. Thank you. Look, may I donate, if I still have it, three minutes to my colleague, Mr. <coughs> Lordship, I will be brief. I want to respond to the following points of law raised by the other side. From the other side, a lot of hue and cry has been made about Article 145, Article 7, and the word shall. Lordship, the Black's Law Dictionary, Brian Gunn, 10th or 9th edition confers six different meanings to the word shall. So for the plain text meaning of the word shall, the dictionary in law gives it six meanings. So shall cannot only mean mandatory. It can mean any other thing. Last law dictionary. In terms of the reading of the constitution, the constitution can be read multiple times. It's not only the textual reading of the Constitution that counts. If I had time to share with my friends that we drink Uji once in a while on the other side, there's a book by Professor Philip Chase Bobbitt that canvasses six methods of reading the Constitution. <coughs> textual reading, moral reading, structural reading, <coughs> or primal reading, or possible reading. Opposite reading has been read in our constitution, Article 259, which is about four elements. If we go to 259.3, moving through reading, first articulated by the case of Edward versus Sankey, 1930 Canada. What does that mean? In this one the court. There's more counsel. So while they were telling us that we are running away from the case, they're telling them, what the? I don't remember. We are ready and we are going to explore the full depths of this constitution on the merits. Please consult this abstract. We are ready to go. <clears throat> the question, another point was raised here, that the president is protected by the constitution in his role in appointing a prophylactic deputy president in a nominating capacity, nominative capacity. The constitution in that manner is deemed as a constituted charter. It creates institutions. The constitution, going by the violations that have been raised on this side, touching on constitutional rights, plays a, pros a protective capacity. So this court will, on the merits, be asked to balance those two shades of the constitution. The constitution as a constitutive charter the Constitution as a protective charter will be discovered from the marriage. My good friend, Senator Professor Tom Jenga, expected all this need to be lifted for the reasons he raised. They have not answered to you to your satisfaction and we attached a case in our submissions the decision of the Ghanaian Supreme Court 
countries back in our submissions a test for overturning a decision made ex parte. They have not satisfied you as to why the decisions of justice uh, more in Kerugua should be overturned. The issue here is broader than mere compensation by way of sums of money from the individual. The broader question here is the constitution and how offices of the constitution are occupied. Article 1, Article 2, Article 3 of the constitution. My good friend and teacher, Mubambi Tiankolo, that there is an absence of a specific textual authorization for judicial involvement in the court. Again, we refer to the various methods of reading the Constitution. So that if we go by their own arguments, and I had my good friend Mr. Solane talk of reading in, that's already available to this court in Article 23. Reading in can't be read. We need to start it for any other constitutional methods here. We can use that as a remedy. So the absence of express uh, textual bar in the Constitution does not preclude this court from reading the Constitution in any other way. <coughs> Several documents are cited here, the Gomez draft, the Kilifi draft. What was missing from all that discussion is the commentary from individual delegates. Because if we had to look at the travel, the preparing for the documents, where are the comments from the delegates? Where is the report of the com for the Committee of Experts? And in any case, the Constitution of 2010 enjoys its imprimatur, its force in law, by the seal of approval it was given by the citizens through a referendum in August 2010. And any law interpreted and read into the Constitution forced the promulgation, that becomes law. These courts have been laboring to do that for some time. Finally, Mr. Minimum, the Senate sits in a quasi-judicial capacity. Yes, the Senate sits in a quasi-judicial capacity. Article 47 kicks in. This court has to exercise judicial review. Madison versus Marbury, 1803. It is inherently the province of the judicial branch to say what the law is. I submit. Thank you. Manual for purposes of the second application, Mr. Ndega will be about five minutes. We'll uh, make some two points and we'll proceed to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Permit me just to indicate what Professor Wilson Brigade Senior Council indicated that the Senate is a chamber or is a political chamber. There can never be something that is far from the truth because in the case of Governor Wambora, that is Kibo Appeal, number 21 of 2014, the Court of Appeal had the opportunity of evaluating that position and it came to a conclusion that when the Senate is seized of a matter of impeachment, it's not just a political chamber, but it converts itself into a quasi-judicial process. And that is why my lady, uh, my lords, under order, study order number 79, the Senate is required to take a special oath before constituting itself in a quasi judicial chamber. On the question, one issue of about justice, uh, justice, the justiciability of the process, it's our humble submission, my ladies, my lords, that that was posted by the enactment of Article 3. At 1, Article 10, 27, 25, 50, 165, and 159 of the Constitution. When the court, when the people of the Republic of Kenya enacted Article 3, it bestowed upon all state organs, any individual, to protect the Constitution. And therefore, there is nothing that is far from the reach of this court, insofar as the protection of the Constitution and Article 3 is an issue, insofar as the upholding of the doctrine of sovereignty is an issue insofar as the application of Article 10, the principles of uh, and the values of governance is co are concerned, and most importantly, the rule of law. How can it be 
that eligibility can be pleaded as a defense, yet the court is being told to uphold the rule of law, good governance, democracy, and the participation of the people. How can it be that this can be a defense when well, Article 165 3D calls upon this court to interrogate whether anything said to be done has been done in accordance to the Constitution? Was the impeachment of the Deputy President not done within the Constitution? Was it not sanctioned by the Constitution? How then can it be from the reach of this court? How then can it be a defense when well, Article 27 creates a doctrine of equality before the law. How can it be argued in that respect? Allow me to address what Professor Ojena addressed. The question of the two-tier trial. Yes, it was a two-tier trial, but was the deputy president granted an opportunity to be heard? My lord, ladies, look at Article 1 and Article 94 of the Constitution as we read together. Article 94 provides for the represent, uh, 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 creates parliament and provides that it's a representation of the people. How can it be a representation of the people and we lock them out when it comes to their participation on a question of um, the impeachment of the, de of the deputy president? How can it be that parliament can be immune from the application of Article 1 and usurp the people's power when the people are supposed to directly participate in giving their views under Article 118 of the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, you are invited to look at the trial at the Senate and you are told that it was time bound. My ladies and gentlemen, it's a misconception and misreading of the Constitution under Article 147 and 145. My ladies and my lords, the only time Senate was limited was, was when or if it constituted itself in a special committee. If what transpired in, in, the, in, the, in the Senate was a matter that was under Article 165, 60, uh, 145, plus 6, then we could say that the 10 days period mattered. But it is important for us and imperative for us, my ladies, my lords, to note that when the Senate starts to hear the impeachment of the deputy president, it is such as a plenary of the House. And as such, the 10 days were not therefore um, applicable in that circumstances. Number two, my ladies, my lords, you have been told that the deputy president avoided to appear for his defense and that he was represented. But my ladies, my lords, if my good learned friend professor was candid with the truth, he would have drawn your attention to the, to the provisions of the rules of procedure for the removal of the president and deputy president, starting order number 78, uh, 9, and you would have drawn your attention to rule number 6. And on that rule number 6, he would have told you that the rule provides that where the president chooses to appear before the Senate, the president shall require uh, sh sh shall be required within three days of the invitation under sub rule four or sub uh, rule four on the date specified in the invitation to file an answer to the charge with the office of the clerk of the Senate in which the president shall set out. He would have told you the mode of appearance. One, the president responds to the particulars of the allegations. Number B, how the president and in this case, the deputy president proposes to appear before the Senate. And that rule has created through mechanisms or through uh, three ways in which the deputy president would have appeared. One, whether in person, two, by advocate, three, in person and by advocate. The operative one in our case, my ladies and my lords, is number three, in person and by, by way of advocate. The deputy president appeared in person and by advocate. And as such, my ladies and my lords, when he was taken in, the question of them appearing in person and in, uh, uh, by advocate was an issue. And number two, my ladies and my lords, he was a witness and the only key witness before the Senate. 
How then could you say that there was fair trial under Article 50 of the Constitution when the only fundamental infrastructure of the trial is unavoidable? But this my notes, permit me to address you on what was submitted by Mr. Somani. It's unfortunate that he has chosen to have a very lean and thin way of looking at the application of Article 149 of the Constitution. There can never be anything that is misleading to say that that article should be uh, read in isolation of other provisions of the Constitution. If you, if you choose to read Act 149 in isolation, you arrive at the absurdity that Mr. Somane and his colleagues have arrived at. I will urge him, uh, urge this one of the court, to look at the import of Article 259 of the Constitution, which provides for the manner in which the Constitution must be interpreted. If Mr. Somani was carried with the truth, he would have uh, 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 invited this honorable court to harmonize and purposely read into Article 147, 149. My ladies, my lords, the reading of Article 149 in a purposive and uh, in a homo, uh, homo, uh, homogeneous way would have told Mr. Somani that then Article 99 and Article 197 of the Constitution is imperative. And they were to say that the IBC had no role in the process of the nomination of Mr. Kindiki is absurd, is not true. The fact is that if Mr. Kindiki was to successively become the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, is it then true that he can become a Deputy President who has not qualified under Article 99 of the Constitution? Is it therefore true that he can become the deputy president if he has not qualified under Article 197 of the Constitution? Who then determines this qualification? Is it the president? Is it Mr. Somane? Is it the I Neighbor? Who determines that qualification? My, my if Lord, it is not Lord, the IBC. My Lord, there is something that uh, Mr. Gill is submitting on, which touches on very critical facts concerning Professor Gilliki as to his qualifications. And we are all familiar with the qualifications of Professor Sidiki. Uh, I think the last time Mr. Kamodo was before you, he said he has no clients. I have a client, the 10th respondent, the United Democratic Alliance. I ceased to ask for the other client because it would have been illegal. But I have a client. So I'm going by your record. And, uh, it is important that uh, the record be made straight with regard to Professor Kidiki's qualification and including uh, what had been cited in the affidavit that he was not a member of the UDA by the, for three months, which is not a requirement in law. No law requires you to be a member of a political party for three months for you to ascend to the position of the deputy president, which Professor Kidiki has acceded to. And secondly, uh, it will be a very issue that you do have. Yes. So we're going to have the opportunity to answer it. Because the law is the opposite of what you say. It was raised by Mr. Gillon, just to clarify. It's then not the time to continue. raise that issue. That is my submission, my law. He is going into the merits of Gillon. But when Mr. Jerome just, just let's sort it. My Lord, it here is a record from Professor Kildiki. I think if <coughs> Mr. Debo Jiro, my very good friend, I usually call him the Black Bull, would keep off the Ashimi's application. The Black what? Bull. That's, that's what Debo Jiro means. Uh, if my friend, the Black Bull, would keep within the remit of a rejoinder and a reply will not be having all these interjections. I have been resisting that because I always try to avoid that very cantankerous. Uh, but uh, if he keeps rehashing his application, unfortunately, then as the person on record for Professor Kidiki, I will be forced to be cantankerous, which is not my nature. Let's give Mr. Jill time to. I am also friends. My friends, finally, let us distinguish the Kisi case from what is before you. What is before you, my ladies, my lords, is a case where a party was not granted an opportunity to be heard. It's a question where there is a violation of Article 37, violation of Article 10, violation of Article 50, 
and violation of Article 25 that the right to be had cannot be derogated. What was in TC, my ladies, my lords, is that the TC deputy governor and went the full trial at the Senate. And therefore, my ladies, my lords, those facts are distinguishable. Finally, my ladies, my lords, Mr. Kumo asked you to find that um, there will be crisis if the position of the deputy president is not filled. I want to remind you that Act 109 and Act 146 has created an avenue and a remedy where if the president is given to be impeached, the remedy is that the, the Speaker of the National Assembly under Act 146 takes over for 60 days and Act, under Act 109, if the two of them are not able to take office, again the remedy is that the Speaker takes over. So we are not in a crisis whatsoever with my ladies, my lords. I invite my learned friend, Senior Mr. Kibe, to proceed. My Lord, uh, I start with the uh, assurance to my learned colleagues that I know what, what you have replied to the issues of law. So I hope uh, I can proceed without a lot of interruptions. My Lord, I start, I start with the submission by my learned colleagues, Professor Mugai. I agree with him a lot that uh, you cannot be able, you are entitled, you are entitled to a legal opinion, but you are not entitled to a set of facts. And therefore, uh, the set of facts is as they are. But my Lord, in saying this, it is important to remember that what also litigants are not uh, entitled to, and this is the reason for conservatory orders, <coughs> is the fact that unlike in war, where you can change facts on the ground, the court looks. Uh, the court does not accept a situation in which one party would be allowed to change facts on the ground in a manner that makes a mockery of the proceedings before it. That is to say, if we are before you on account of the fact that there have been violations in the impeachment process, my Lord and the conservatory orders that have prevented the completion of those illegalities are in issue, this court should not permit a situation in which a party is able to say that uh, let me change certain facts as it were by completing the violations. Well, there there is a question of public interest. We don't have to say much about it, but coming from the owner of Attorney General, my Lord, I would only ask that public interest from the Attorney General must also be read, apart from what he is directing, is friendly to the government, must also be read to what is also friendly to the people of Kenya. And that is a desire to ensure that the impeachment process is done credibly and upholding all the rights and the procedures that are in issue. So that it is still possible for the Attorney General to say that public interest in this particular scenario would require that fundamental rights, a case on fundamental rights, be concluded before you can be able to say this or the other person should take office. My Lord, there is the issue of uh, the conservatory owners have had to read them again, the one from Justice Mwongo, because they have been called as orders of reinstatement or mandatory, manda or mandatory injunctions. My Lord, I believe and I have a lot of full confidence in the fact that it would not be possible for Judge Mwongo to issue mandatory injunction on the assessment at that level. And as a matter of fact, he did not. The prayers as framed is purely to preserve this matter pending hearing and determination of the petition. So it's a scarecrow argument to say you are seeking reinstatement, you are seeking mandatory injunction. There is no such thing allowed. Coming to Professor Ujena, he said many things, uh, there are only two that I wish to respond to. One of these is the uh, observation, his uh, reactions to the fact that, uh, the, to the Senate process and about the deputy president. But Lord, I wish you and I hope the court will not, the substantial lack of empathy in the circumstances of the Senate about why the DP was not there 
what remarks ought to be made and what ought not to be made. Second issue that uh, we wish to make uh, with regard to the issue of uh, Professor Ojeda is of course this issue that you are saying that is saying there is no comeback from impeachment and all this and that we proceed and swear. My Lord, if that were to be the case, then it would mean that uh, impeachment is not the, sub the legitimate subject matter of this honorable court. Yet we have had the decisions that they have read themselves from the Supreme Court on the issues of impeachment. My Lord, uh, Mr. Motio Modoni, can call my, my friend, came with these interesting arguments that uh, on the issues of uh, jurisdiction. My Lord, uh, these issues of jurisdiction is an interesting one, as you'll see it in a minute. My Lord, the first uh, impeachment case that appeared before a three judge bench was in uh, Kerugoya. Kerugoya seems to favor a lot of impeachment stuff. And it created from the end cases. I don't know whether Professor Ujenda was there. <laughs> <laughs> but my Lord, uh, it, it is important to say this with regards to that. That I actually made the precise argument that my learned friend Mr. Mugobi made about whether the question of impeachment under the constitutions of Kenya was justiciable or not. The three judge bench held that it was justiciable, and it is on the basis of that because it relates to the issues of Bill of Rights and procedure. And they well, let him also tell you whether it was the impeachment of the president, because my yes, submission was not that the impeachment is generally non justiciable, even the authority has said that. It was about the impeachment of the president, whether that is justiciable. I'll come to that in a minute. But the point I want to make, eh, for purposes of the argument, the authority is there. For purposes of the argument, those precise arguments were made. There is actually no distinction when you look at the impeachment for Governor under 181, how it is carried out in the release the one of the president. But one of the significant position that I wish to make from that case is this. That the subsequent thereto, all courts from Court of Appeal to Supreme Court have taken the position that it was the desire of the Kenyan people that nothing shall be beyond the reach of the court for purposes of giving a And that is the basis upon which we have been proceeding. I will end it up there and come to what is more comfortable with jurisdiction with regard to our purported Oscar of the jurisdiction of this court with regard to impeachment of the president. My Lord, uh, jurisdiction is actually not given in the manner that uh, they are suggesting. My Lord, even for purposes of the governor, which he says is different, uh, there is no provision <laughs> under Article 181 that says, uh, or 182, let me just confirm. Yes, my Lord, uh, for purposes of uh, the removal of county government under 181, the issue is none of those procedures actually says that uh, after you are done with impeachment, you will go to the uh, uh, the <laughs> 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 I know that but my Lord, the, the, the point I'm making is that even for purposes of Article 181 and 182 of the Constitution, there is nowhere that those provisions say that when you are done with impeachment at the Senate, you will go to the High Court. But nonetheless, you, people have been going to the High Court on account of jurisdiction as set out in Article 165 of the Constitution, the jurisdiction of the country. And therefore, my Lord, this requirement that, oh, there is no provisions for going to court, it is neither there nor is neither here nor there. That, that is not the design of the Constitution. That question of jurisdiction has been set up by specific provisions of the Constitution. My Lord, what about these issues that uh, you needed to go to the Supreme Court? Well, for purposes of the jurisdictions of the Supreme Court, it has been settled very clearly, I believe it has under, under Article 163, Sub Article 3, 
and uh, it is settled in a manner that it says in very, very conclusive uh, terms, this is uh, 163, uh, I believe it is two, it is actually three and four. They, they completely settle what is within the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Their argument that you cannot arrogate jurisdiction would actually come into play in this particular matter if this court were to make a finding that this matter ought to go before the Supreme Court. Because effectively, you would be amending Article 160, 163, 3 and 4 of the Constitution as to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. But my Lord, uh, where you find comfort is that the jurisdictions of the High Court, and that's why it is a court of original civil and whatever and criminal jurisdiction, is that the High Court has jurisdictions in everything unless the Constitution says otherwise. And to deal with that when we come to the Senate, the moment, my Lord, you say the Senate was sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity, it is a design of the Constitution that any person who sits in a quasi-judicial capacity, there is a right to go to the High Court. There is no law in this country, not one, in which any person who sits in a quasi-judicial capacity, there is no remedy to go to the High Court by way of appeal, by way of uh, Article 23, or any other manner. So that issue of jurisdiction is neither here nor there from the plain reading of the Constitution itself. For, for the, so the other cases of uh, Nixon, all those, they would be neither here nor there as far as uh, we are concerned. Mr. Mimimo say talked about... While you are still on that issue. Yes, my Lord. Uh, Dr. Alfred, I also addressed this. But what is your view on the submissions by Dr. Tenkuli about the constitutional history? Oh, yes. That issue. Uh, that, that's very interesting. Right? I think I should say something. I was just giving myself additional pressure. But uh, for purposes of, uh, of that history, and uh, incidentally, as a young lawyer, I was involved in all these process, that is the of the winter of Korea, so I can speak in uh, fast knowledge of some of these issues. But uh, this bomber's draft constitution you actually find it very interesting, I cannot go deeply into it. But the issue that uh, is important to note is that under the Bomber's draft of constitution, there was first of all impeachment was dealt with as a justiciable issue, but it was justiciable at the Senate. So the argument that it was unjusticiable cannot be supported by the Thomas draft. And then the other constitution that was actually talking about the issue of impeachment being justiciable, either at the high court level or at any other level. But my Lord, the important issue would be how we travel to the position that we are in today. And my Lord, the positions that we are in today, as my land friend is pointing out, is that when you compare, particularly the Bomber's draft and the, and, and, and the current one, you would actually see that the jurisdiction of the High Court was actually increased in the 2010 Constitution. And the jurisdiction of the, court, of the Supreme Court was actually reduced in comparison to what it was at the Bomber's. So that, my Lord, we are in a happy situation that uh, you arrive at a situation where by the High Court is the main court for purposes of the 20 Constitution, which reinforces the arguments that we made. Democracy in this country fails or succeeds, depending mainly on the decisions of the High Court. My Lord, uh, the, uh, I hope I've answered uh, that issue of the history, my Lord, uh, because of the usual pressure of time. My Lord, Mr. Milimo, I believe he made many points, I will choose one or two. He alleged that nobody is disputing that uh, public participation was carried out properly or anything. My learned colleague, uh, Mr. Sankipa, has pointed out to me that there are actually five that says that, and one of them was actually by Mr. Omoke, 
the advocate who was here to say that the process was a completely murdered up and they got it wrong. My lord, the only other point that uh, was made when Milimo was speaking was to say that the speaker has no vote. It is true, we are aware of all of us. The speaker has no vote. But my lord, uh, everybody, uh, Coco, uh, and is actually the duty in the standing orders and in the constitution, as a presiding officer in the National Assembly or in the Senate, uh, the speaker, if there is a duty of impartiality. That is where all, and, and, and anything you read about the speaker, they talk about that. 